Welcome everybody to the Disciple Maker broadcast. I am Matthew Fisher. Thanks for joining me today. And last week we talked about acknowledging God in all of our ways and how He will, how He will direct our paths through the Holy Spirit that will lead us into all truth, the manifestations of God's Word in our life and how He will show us things to come. Now the Holy Spirit doesn't show us those things to come for us to worry and try to figure out how we're going to make those things come to pass. He shows us those things to come so we can have faith for those things and we can seek God for the direction concerning those things. And we talked about how care or worry will get in the way from allowing the Holy Spirit to direct our paths and it will cause us to try to go and make our own path outside of the will of God for our life. Today we're going to talk about how worry allows false prophets to creep into the church. But before we go into today's Bible lesson, let's go ahead and start this show with prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we exalt you, we acknowledge you, we enthrone you, we magnify you over today's broadcast in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your grace, we thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for revealing your truth to us today in Jesus' name. Now let's go ahead and turn it. Turn your Bible to Matthew, the 6th chapter. We've been going over some verses from this scriptures, right? This set of scriptures last couple weeks. I want to dig into it first to get a, to lay a foundation of exactly what we're supposed to be doing instead of going to seek for these false prophets, what Jesus, what Jesus has laid out for us to do. I'm going to read quick because we've got to go over a lot of stuff. I'm trying to get it all done within this 30-minute broadcast. It says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on it. Is not the life more than me, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore I say, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whether, whither all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient Unto the day is the evil thereof. And I want to start out this Bible study by looking at two verses. Verse 27 and comparing it to verse 23. See, verse 27 says, Which of you by taking thought or worrying can add one cubit unto his height or stature? And worrying is the reciprocal. It is the exact the direct opposite with the say with the opposite results as seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness by worrying or taking thought or carrying care he says nothing can be added unto us this way we can't even add an inch to our height we there's no profit in worrying there's no Profit in taking care and trying to figure things out. But he says, but there is a way of obtaining profit. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these things shall be added unto you. So that is how we counter worry in our life. We, can't, we counter stress, we counter worry, we counter anxiety by seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And there's profit in that. Though he says, then all things will be, all these things that we were worried about before will be now added unto us when we seek God first in His kingdom and His righteousness. So you might ask, how do I, how do you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? It's as simple as one, one thing. It's trusting God. Period. It's as simple as just trusting God. And now I'm going to just explain it a little more in detail now. I've heard a lot of people say seeking first the kingdom of God is God's rule. And his righteousness is God's right way of doing things. And, it, and they make it... they narrow, they narrow it down to just a bunch of rules, trying to follow a bunch of rules. But Christianity was never made for us to follow a bunch of rules. Adam couldn't follow the rules in the Garden of Eden. The Jews could not follow the rules of the law. So Jesus came to set us free from those rules. That's not what this scripture is talking about. God's rule is correct, but in a proper context. The best way I can explain it to you in sports, we use the term, we often use the term like, for instance, Michael Jordan imposed his will in the fourth quarter of that game to take control of the game. And that's what seeking first the kingdom of God is. It is casting our cares into the hands of God and leaving them there and allowing God to impose or enforce his will in our situation. Now, in seeking first his righteousness is not about following a bunch of rules that God has made for us. That's not what that's it's talking about. His righteousness. Not trying to go in, going about and establishing our own righteousness, but seeking God's righteousness, which is only found in Jesus Christ. Trusting the finished works of Jesus Christ enough to say, I'm going to rest from trying to make my own way and I'm going to receive what Jesus has done for me. It's Like I said before, it comes down to just trusting God. Now I want to get into, lead up into the Bible lesson for today of, of how worry and by not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, but actually worrying and taking thought for the future allows us to, to open the door for false prophets to take control and have influence in our life. Verse 34 says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So Jesus says, take no thought for tomorrow. Because the, the Bible talks about we, part, we prophesy in part, we know in part, but it's, that's just in part. We're not looking, the, he tells us not to look towards the future, not to go around seeking, trying to find out what's going to happen in the future. There's enough going on today. To, the, the Bible says, to, because we can never... We'll never be able to enjoy today as long as we're worrying about tomorrow. If we have all kinds of cares of what's going on tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow concerning this, or what's going to happen concerning that tomorrow, we, can, we can't enjoy today. And fear of tomorrow is why a lot of people are seeking after these false prophets. But the Bible says that he daily loads me up with benefits. So I have benefits coming to me today. I'm in expectation for benefits to come to me today. I'm in ex uh, He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That includes today. This is the day 
the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it today. I shall enjoy and be glad in today instead of worrying about having fear for the future. Now there's three reasons why we go, we go off seeking prophets instead of um, in, in, in giving ourselves to these prophets. Number one, no one has ever told people that they can bypass the middleman and go straight to the source. The source is Jesus Christ. He's the source of our faith. And, the, and, and, and through him, the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. And this is, this is, this is in no respect to person. Before we even go, I want to show you in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11. This is no respect to a person. No one person has authority that, that, that another person doesn't if besides, the, if besides the person not having the means of Jesus. It says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to greatest. So we can bypass the middleman. Through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, through the grace of Jesus Christ, I can go directly to God to get my word. Number two, we come to, we seek prophets because we have, instead of casting our cares unto God, we have a care for the future. We're caring, we're caring about what's going to happen tomorrow like Jesus said, not to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, but, in, but we counter that through seeking first the kingdom of God and trusting God. But instead of trusting God, I'm worried about tomorrow, so I'm going to go run from prophet to prophet and to try to find out, get something that I want to hear. Number three, most of these prophets, 90, 95% of these pro, so-called prophets are not called by God. The Bible talks about how the gifts of callings of God are without repentance. But the bottom line is, many of these prophets are not called from God in the first place. That's why these people are... See, I, I, I say it like this. There's an old saying that says, that says, Give a man a fish, he's fed for a day. Teach a man how to fish, he's fed for a lifetime. So, instead of telling you that you could go to God every day, whenever you need to, and get your word, and get counsel, get comfort, get whatever you need regarding to your life. The Bible says he's given us all we need for life and godliness. That means counsel, wisdom, he'll teach us, he'll get comfort us. He'll lead us. He'll guide us. But instead, the spirit of divination that's working will cause, will, will, will give you a word and never tell you. And they'll act like they're so anointed, how they did so much become anointed. They'll never tell you, you can go to God directly through, through, um, they'll, they, you go, they'll never tell you you can go to God directly, but they say you got to come to them, the middle man. So therefore, you, they keep you under their influence, running back for prophecy after prophecy. Every time you feel like you need to hear a word from God, instead of going to God directly, now we're going to these prophets. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And I want to show you something in Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 19. It says, And it came to pass, as we went to pray, certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by suit, saying, The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned to the spirit and said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw the hope of the uh, hope of their gains was gone, they caught Pilate, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto their rulers.
that was a spirit of divination telling the future and we see that that um it brought her masters much gain and that's the same thing that we see going on in the church today it's not a spirit it's not a if that was a if that was a gift or calling of God that woman had Paul wouldn't have been able to cast that demon out of her but that was a fortune telling spirit going around telling pe people the future that that spirit wasn't of God that's why it had to be cast out of the woman and the woman in verse 17 it says they preach the way of salvation so just because some of these prophets come, might come and say Jesus, they might say God, they might say Holy Spirit, they might quote a scripture or two, that doesn't mean they're not operating under this spirit of divination. It, 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 but we look in 16, it said it brought her masters much gain to soothsaying. And, you know, you might wonder why I know about, you know, uh, so much about this. Number one... God has revealed it to me. God has revealed these things to me. Number two, I've been victim of these things. I've been under the influence of these prophets. And I thank God for deliverance. I've, I've heard prophets come and I went out, prof, man prophesied to me about uh, a house. I went out driving around for two or three hours looking for this so-called House. I've been part of an organization that brings these so-called prophets in for no other means but to get people to give big offerings. That's it. It's no different than what was going on in the book of Acts chapter 16. They're bringing these people in for profit. And they're it's a spirit of divination at work in the church. A lot of people will believe, oh, well, he was called from the youth before, before he ever um, found God. I was called to be a prophet, and I had the gift of prophecy. That's the spirit of divination. That's that same spirit of divination that was work in this woman. It needs to be cast out. You cannot have um, a you can, there cannot be a prophet unless without through the spirit of Jesus Christ a prophet is is supposed to point people to Jesus Christ that is the job of a prophet that is the job of the, the fivefold ministry directing people to Jesus Christ but you say well. What if, I've, what if I already know Jesus Christ? What if I already have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Then it's all right for them to uh, tell me my future and I run to the prophet for my future. No, the prophet still should point you to Jesus Christ because your prophet is in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. So either though we might already have a relationship, instead of trying to run to people trying to figure out what's going to happen into the future, my prophet is not my prophet, not the word pro the prophet is in gain. My gain is coming through Jesus Christ. It's not coming through trying to figure out what's going to happen in my future. The gain is coming through Jesus Christ. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. From start to finish. I don't put my word trust in somebody telling me and trying to predict the future. Unfortunately, these so-called prophets working under the spirit of divination have congregations full of people under their control. And it's, un it's the spirit of witchcraft. And they use they use intimidation as a means to do this. They say, "Believe my word, or else God has spoken. God has spoken, and if you don't do my word, 
the word I just told you, you'll be in trouble. For example, one day this, uh, these, these two people came up to me claiming to be prophets. And the, girls, the girl said, if you will cut your hair within seven days, says the Lord, something extremely bad is going to happen to you. I didn't feel like cutting my hair. God didn't tell me to cut my hair. My Bible tells me God looks at God looks at my heart. God looks at the inward parents. He's not even looking at the outside of a man. So I, I, I didn't believe it. I don't believe that. I knew that was a spirit of intimidation. See, with it, I, it's something about a power trip. These people feel like they 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 by getting you under their influence, they have control now. They have power now. And yeah, the Bible tells us that um, we have been given authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and all the authority of the devil. But guess what? You don't have authority over me. Jesus Christ has authority over me. Now the enemy, yeah, take authority over him. But the bottom line is a lot of these people are not even operating under the same God, under the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. They're operating under a false anointing, a spirit of divination. And I speak to you right now, if you are under the influence of the spirit of divination, I plead the blood of Jesus and I declare that you are free through the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name. I ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to you in Jesus' name. And that's why these people have prophecy schools, schools of prophets, which is not found, a school for prophets is not found not one time in the Bible. But we hear that, that we hear school of prophets so much, we think it's in the Bible. We actually think this is in the Bible. I thought it was in the Bible. When, when, when the Lord first told me to speak against a school for prophets, I kind of questioned it. I went ahead and obeyed it, but I questioned it because I thought it was in the Bible. Then I had to dig around, and not the Bible does not mention not one time a school of prophets. Now there was people who came up under Samuel, Elijah, and them under the, under in those days as servants to those people. But there was never a school that made somebody a prophet. Let's go to 1 Corinthians fifteen ten. See, so there'll be people who tell people how I've heard I've heard these prophets tell people how do you become ask people ask how do you become a prophet? Oh, um, well, I went and anointed my closet, and I laid there for six hours until the Holy Spirit told me that 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 I've been called a prophet to the nations. So basically, you're saying that you did something to earn the title prophet. But let's see what Paul says right here in 1510 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So, we got to understand it's God's grace what makes us who, I, who we are in the kingdom of God. And it was his grace that allowed Paul to labor more abundantly. He didn't take credit for anything. Paul got called on the road to Damascus. Paul wasn't doing anything near Try to do right. He was persecuting the church while God called him, while God showed him to him, to, to revealed himself to Paul. And so, what did Paul do to, to deserve to be called apostle and who wrote two thirds of the New Testament? Absolutely nothing. He didn't work for it. And it, the Bible talks about if it be of works, it's no longer. Of grace, and if it be of grace, it is no longer of works. So
So if someone is always bragging about their anointing and what they did to deserve this anointing, that is a false, that is a spirit of witchcraft. That is a spirit of divination. That is not a true spirit of God operating because a true spirit of God, you, if someone asked them, what did you do to become a prophet? I did not do anything. I did not to do anything to become who I am today. I don't deserve to be called what I'm called today because you know why? Jesus Christ gets all the credit. That's, that's a true apostle. That's a true apostle. That's a true prophet. They point you to the grace of Jesus Christ. They don't point you to their own efforts. They don't point you to their own works. Oh, well, you know, I did this and I did that. And it's all about what I did to become this prophet. No, a prophet will always point you to Jesus Christ. That is their responsibility. That's what they did in the Old Testament. I mean, look at Isaiah. Look at those prophets. They prophesy about the future Messiah to come. That, that is what the law is left to do. That is what the Old Testament is left to do. And that is what us who are still living in this dispensation of grace are called to do. Point men to Jesus Christ. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the light. Matthew Fisher is nobody's savior. The Pope is nobody's savior. Chief apostle, bishop, whatever, is not anybody's savior. There is one savior, the person of Jesus Christ. And he tells us how to get results. So we don't got to keep going around looking for results. He tells us plainly how to get them. So we don't look to titles. Most of these titles are man-made titles anyway. Most of these titles were not a true calling from God. They're man-made titles to look high-minded in the sight of men, to earn that respect in the sight of men. You go back to um, Jesus, how he rebuked. Who did Jesus rebuke all the time? Did he rebuke sinners all the time? I mean, they were all sinners, but did he rebuke the known sinners? No. Jesus rebuked the, the, the Pharisees who, who, were, who liked to get the respect of man. And as I preach this today, as I teach this Bible lesson today, I am not that putting down anybody but what it is is revealing the truth so the people who are under the influence of these demonic spirits can be set free but we're out of time with today's broadcast until next time god bless until next time on the disciple maker broadcast tell someone that jesus loves them and go make disciples